Ladies, join us September 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. for Ladies of Life. Free food and child care will be provided, so make sure you sign up at our info center. If God has been working in your life, or if you have any prayer requests, please join us at lifechurchok.com in the Amen Corner. on our feet, all right?
you are a savior with every heart with all we are we give you praise you are a savior with every heart with all we are we give you praise you are a savior with every
glad you're in church today. Amen. Do you feel just a special moving of the Lord here today? Just something kind of very close, very special? I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. I don't know what might be going on in your life, but probably in this crowd this morning, there are people that are here that you came to this service with a special need in your life. You need God to touch you. You need financial help. You need health in your life. You need a relationship, maybe something to take place in a relationship, maybe in your marriage, on the job. But you're here today, and even though the presence of God is so real and moving in this place, you're worried about something that you're going through. I just want you to realize and know that God knows that you're here today. He knows what you need. And most importantly, God wants to give to you and minister to you today the very need that's in your life. So I want you just to just take one hand and just kind of lift it up toward heaven. Eyes closed. I want you to just say right now, say, Jesus, I sense your presence. I know that you know I'm here. And I know you know what I need. So I just receive from you today what you have for me. I accept it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's give him a great big hand clap. Can you do that? Amen. Amen. We're so glad to have everyone with us today. My, what a great crowd. Before you're seated, turn around and shake hands with a couple of people. Just tell them you're glad to see them today. Amen. Our ushers are coming, and while they're coming, wait up on you for our offering this morning. Just want to real quickly remind you, if you are new here today, if you're new to Life Church, right in front of you there on the back of the chair in front of you, there is a visitor's card. Would you fill that out and turn that in to us today? You can turn it in during the offering if you get it filled out in time. If not, you can turn it in out in the foyer. It just simply helps us to make contact with you to get to know you. And if you have any questions at that time, you can ask and uh, we'll try to help you in every way we can. So do that and we'd appreciate it. Also, if you're new to Life Church or you are a new convert, we have a program called Steps. It simply takes you through everything that you need to know as a Christian. If you've recently given your heart to life the Lord or if you're new to Life Church, it's going to tell you what we believe. It's going to tell you about the doctrines of the church. It's going to tell you how to study the Bible, to read the Bible. It's going to tell you what God expects of you and what you can expect of God. So uh, you can go online and uh, fill that out and study that, go through it step by step. You can go to the, to the information center. We have hard copies. You can pick one up, and you can go through it that way. But avail yourself to this, and it will help you grow spiritually. All right? Amen. Okay, let's give all of our guests a great big hand. We're glad to have you. Amen. If you've taken the tithe challenge, we want to encourage you to continue to give. I know God is going to bless you in your faithfulness and in your giving. Father, we love you. What a privilege and what an honor it is to be in your house today. We have already sensed your presence during this time of worship. 
We've opened our hearts and we have received from you already. So as we continue our worship by giving back to you, we just ask, Lord, that you would take what is given today and use it to further this gospel so that everyone, not only in our town of McAllister and the surrounding areas, but through missions around the world, people can find you as their personal Savior. We ask it in your name, and everybody say it, amen. The theologian Herman Bovink said that the entire Christian belief system stands or falls with the confession of God's Trinity. It is the core of the Christian faith. So what do we believe when we say that God is a triune God? We believe that God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God, and there is one God. Each person of the Godhead is distinct in his primary way of relating to the world. The Father plans, the Son executes, the Spirit applies. God the Father is the great architect of creation and redemption. God the Son obeys the Father and accomplishes redemption. And together, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to apply that very same redemption. It is in the doctrine of the Trinity that we feel the heartbeat of God for his people. Every blessing, both spiritual and material, comes to us from a triune God. In the name of the triune God, we are baptized. To a triune God, we will forever bring thanksgiving and honor. And in the triune God, we find rest for our souls and peace for our conscience. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see you all here today. We are so glad that you have joined us. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Me too. It is a good day. I, I'm, I'm so thankful for uh, modern technology and all that God is doing through it. Uh, we had last week our first week to be live on Facebook, and uh, we had in a week's time over 2,000 people join us for church last Sunday. Is that pretty awesome or what? Come on. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And uh, we just want to welcome all those who will be joining us on Facebook, whether right now live or later this week. You may find yourself wide awake at midnight and think, what can I do? And you stumble upon this crazy church out here on the highway and you start watching church with us. And uh, so we want to welcome all of those who are joining us online, whether on Facebook or on LifeChurchOK.com. God bless you. Come on, let's give them a big hand this morning. If you are in the McAllister area, we want to invite you to come join us and uh, to be a part of our services here. we got a wonderful thing going for your kids, for your teenagers, adults, uh, and we got a lot of good, friendly people. Amen? So, we will make you feel at home, so come and join us. Would you stand with me as we bless this word and we get ready to go into this message today? Father, we love you, and we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what you do, and I just pray today that you would begin to move mightily, that you begin to touch through this word. Lord, we know your word is living and active, and it works in every area of our lives. And I pray right now that you would move into each and every mind, heart, and soul, and you begin to touch and minister, that we would leave here different than the way we walked in because we have been with you. You are good, you are faithful, and you are true. And so we ask that your word that is real would become real to us today. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. Let people hear your voice and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Before you sit down, go to three people you do not know. Introduce yourself. Ready, set, go. You know, that's always a wonderful noise to hear at church, people laughing and shaking hands and being friendly, amen? A little glimpse of what heaven's going to be like, and I'm so thankful for that. So, we are in the middle of a series here called The Trinity, 
And uh, whether you've been with us over the last few weeks or not, we have discussed week one, God the Father. He's the mastermind of it all. He created everything and he made the ability for us to be able to grasp in our mind who he is because he has a plan, a plan to connect with his creation. He loved his creation, his messed up, fallen, rebellious creation so much that he put on flesh and he came to this earth as Jesus. Jesus was born. He lived 33 years. At 33 years and three years into his ministry, he was crucified and he was killed and became the ultimate sacrifice for your sins and my sins so that the sins of all the world could be forgiven and they could be set free from every mistake, every mishap, every past fault. They could be free. Jesus came to own the heart. Then Jesus, after he arose from the grave on the third day, he appeared to his disciples and he said to them, Hey, I got to go back to the Father, but I'm going to send a promise to you, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and made a way for you and I to move from religion to relationship. The Holy Spirit was given for you and I so that we could no longer live ritualistically or, or, or based upon a religion or based upon rules and regulations, but now based solely upon a relationship with our sovereign God. And today and next week, as we dive into the essence of who the Holy Spirit is, I want you to get ready because there are many attributes and many qualities that the Holy Spirit has that if we will avail ourselves to them, and we'll open ourselves up to them, it'll become something that'll be impactful to our life. Amen? Amen. So, as we dive in today, I want to remind you of our opening text in our main verse, which is found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 38 through verse 40. It says, Jesus taught, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. For this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we find that the ability to love our neighbor and to love each other is going to be found after we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all of our mind. The heart, the soul, the mind makes up the human trinity. When the human trinity comes in contact with the holy trinity, we find ourselves being complete in God and being able to experience the fullness of who he is inside of us. Amen? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was not for just a goosebump to be felt in church. It was for you to be able to have relationship, for you to be able to have the fullness of who God is on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit poured out then is the same Holy Spirit we feel in this place today. It's the same Holy Spirit that goes with us everywhere we go. Matthew 18 verse 20 says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. He is here today. <laughs> the Spirit of God is here today. And what that means this morning is whatever you came in dealing with, if you will allow him to, he will exchange what you're dealing with and give you something greater. You can walk out of here different than the way you walked in because you were impacted by God and his presence. Not because you came to church, not because you sang a song, not because you heard Taryn preach, but because you experienced God and who he is. Amen? So the Holy Spirit makes a way for relationship. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I love how Paul said it here when he said, Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? Look at that same scripture out of the message. The message says it this way. It says, Didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Look at this next line. You don't see, don't you see, that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for. The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through the way you live. Woo, that's powerful, isn't it? Think about that. John 14, verse 26 says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 
So Jesus was telling his followers, listen to this, he was saying, when I go to the Father and the Spirit is given, what's going to happen is, is at that moment as believers, you will have full access to any and everything that is mine. When you become saved and you receive the Spirit of God on the inside of you, every attribute of God now dwells on the inside of you. You don't have to beg God for it. It's there. But your willingness to tap into it is up to you, which we're going to point out here in just a second. It's up to each of us. John chapter 3, verse 30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. He must grow more prominent. I must grow less prominent. If what you want is more important than what the Spirit is leading you to do, you are not allowing God to have full access to your life. And why is that? A lot of times we don't want to give God full access to our life because we're scared He'll find out something about us. But the good news is today, He already knows. Look at your neighbor and tell him He already knows. He already knows. There's nothing you and I can hide from God. He already knows. There's nothing you can keep a secret from. He already knows. There's no feeling you have on the inside He doesn't know about. There's no struggle you're dealing with that He doesn't already know about. There's no pain you're struggling with that He doesn't know. God knows all. He sees all. There's nothing that we can hide from Him. And so we just need to come to Him and allow Him to have full access to us and us to have full access to what He has for us. And at that moment, we will begin to change and be transformed and who we are because he's living and he's active on the inside of us. We do not serve a God that just sits on a throne and just watches. We serve a God that is active. We serve a God that is powerful. We serve a God that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly far above and beyond anything we could ever ask, dream, or imagine. And every bit of that power dwells in you. Amen? First mm. John 3.20, look at this right here. Whenever our hearts and tormenting self-accusation make us feel guilty and condemn us, for we are in God's hands. Have you ever felt guilty? Have you ever felt condemned for your actions? He is above and greater than our consciences, our hearts, and He knows and perceives and understands everything, for nothing is hidden from Him. Hebrews 4.13, nothing is in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. So if nothing is hidden from God's sight, and He knows our struggles, then as Spirit-filled believers, there is hope. There is help for us. Look what Matthew chapter 7 says. In Matthew 7, verse 16 through 20, Jesus said, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good, bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. So I want to ask you this question this morning, and then we're going to land the plane here for just a little bit. What does your life say about your life? Deep question, I know. But what is it that your life is saying about your life? What does your earthly life, what does your thoughts, what does your actions, what does the words that flow out of your mouth, what does your eyes say about it, what does the way you treat people, your reactions to people who maybe don't treat you right, say about your life? Did you know everything you say and do says something about you? It's getting quiet in here now. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. Let's talk about this a little bit. Galatians 5, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to begin reading at verse 16. And what we're going to find in this passage of Scripture is what the world offers us and what Jesus offers us. And there are two options, not a third. Amen? And so we're going to find this out. Maybe you'll find yourself somewhere within these page, these verses here. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. And this is what it says. Are you ready? All right, Paul's writing to the church of Galatia, and he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. That's good right there. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. 
The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Good intentions. You leave church on a Sunday morning and you said, this is the week. I'm going to live for Jesus. I will not fall. I will not fail. I will not cuss. You're pulling out of church and someone pulls out in front of you and nearly runs you off the road and you let every word out you've got. And you think, Dad, gummit, I'm missing it off the wait till next week now. Constantly in conflict. The good news is they'll never not be in conflict. So there's nothing wrong with you. That's just normal. You live in a fallen world, and the world's going to want to rule, and Jesus wants to rule, but it's up to us to determine who we let rule. Amen? These two forces are fighting all the time. They're constantly fighting each other, so you not carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you're not under the obligation to the law of Moses. Look at verse 19. It says, when you follow the desires of your, fin- your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Here's the examples of them. Sexual immorality impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, And other sins like these. Now listen to this next line. Let me tell you again as I have before that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we love to harp on the biggies in our mind. Yeah, Pastor Turn, you preach against that sexual sin. You tell them you're wrong. And the whole time we're out gossiping about them and their sexual sin. And the gossipers are going to miss heaven just as bad as the ones in sexual sin. Boy, we're not going to, I'm not getting amen today. Well, I'm not out gossiping. Yeah, but you're causing division at work. The Bible says dividers will not make it into heaven. You're causing division in your home or in your family. Well, I'm, I'm not a divider, Pastor. Yeah, but you're jealous of what someone else has. Phew. I mean, the bottom line is all these are attributes of the world. Have you ever struggled with jealousy? Have you ever struggled with drunkenness? Have you ever struggled with all these things, these things I just read? I mean, these are parts of what the world has to offer us. These are the examples. You see it every day. I see it every day. It's plastered all over social media. It's plastered all over the news. It's plastered everywhere in a fallen world. And a fallen world is acting as it should, as a fallen world. But we as Christians, when we receive Jesus, we become spirit-filled And as spirit-filled Christians, we then gain something different than what the world has to offer. And this is what we gain. But the Holy Spirit produces in you this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who the Lord, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So when we have the fruits of the Spirit in us, and we allow them to be active in us, the things of the world become less important because we want to grow in the fruit. By your fruit, you are recognized. There's fruit from the world, and there's fruit from the Lord. So by the fruit, you're recognized. But let's talk about the Holy Spirit's fruit because if we're Spirit-filled, that means the fruit of the Spirit dwells inside of us. So we have all these, but maybe just maybe we've not allowed them to be activated. Number one, let's talk about love. Who doesn't love to be loved? I've never met anybody that said, you know, I just love being hated. I just love it. I just love it when people talk bad about me. I just love it when people in the street, no, everybody wants to be loved. That's what this world needs today is a bunch of love, wouldn't you say? And who is love? God 
is love. And so if you and I will choose to be God-like and give that love away, people will begin to experience the love of God. Where did it begin? God so loved the world, John 3.16 says, that he gave his son, his begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was love to give his son. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 says, This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Whew. That's black and white, isn't it? That's tough right there. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Now look at this, 1 John 4, 20, verse 21. This really needs to be declared over the world today, and especially our United States. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The commands we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. I'm here to tell you if everybody would read that scripture before they want to go out and they want to do some hateful marches and they want to stand for what they think is right, I'm not against free speech, but I'm against some Christians who want to go out and get themselves entangled in division and entangled in hate and entangled in things that are not godly. It's time for us as believers to stand up and be spirit-filled believers and love people. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter how much money they make we're just going to love people it's about God and it's about people and we all need some love amen look at your neighbor and tell him you need some love you need some love number two joy oh my goodness people need joy when was the last time you just laughed I mean you laughed well I just haven't had time Pastor Taryn well I've just been too busy Pastor Taryn to laugh did you know that laughter works like a medicine in this day and time when we have more sicknesses ever than ever maybe just maybe we need to laugh and release some good medicine in us you need to watch something funny you need to laugh when someone trips not spiritually, I'm just talking. I mean, you know when somebody trips and falls, you, you are going to laugh. You may go and make sure they're okay first, and then you are going to laugh. My staff loves to scare Pastor Keith. And they get behind the curtain in his office. And then when he is about to sit down in his seat, they jump out from behind that curtain, and Keith screams to the top of his lungs, and everybody just laughs. Keith doesn't laugh his first. But you know what? Laughter's contagious. When you start laughing, somebody else is going to start laughing. Why? Because it's contagious. Joy is contagious. So is negative people. It's contagious. So is being just unhappy all the time and sour all the time and not having any fun. I'm going to tell you, when, where in Scripture did we read that Christians are supposed to be the most boring, unfun, non-friendly people? We have the Holy Spirit who is the author of joy. And if that joy is in us, it's time for us to let it out. And we need to start having a good time. I don't want to come to church and be bored. I don't want to hang out with a bunch of people that think they got it made and don't know how to trust God and admit when they need the Lord in their life. I'm here to tell you there are days that I need Him more than ever before. And there are days that I need His joy in my life. And it may just be you saying something funny that makes me laugh and releases me from the chains that are trying to hold me back. Let some joy out in your life. Be happy. Laugh at something. Have a good time in this life. (laughs) Nehemiah 8 verse 10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. When you're going through hell, find something that makes you laugh. It'll give you strength. Number three, peace. Who couldn't use some peace? This world needs peace today. Isaiah 55 verse 12 says, you shall go out with joy and be led out with what? Peace. He said, you'll be led with peace. Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Some of us need some peace. 
You need peace in your mind. You need peace in your heart. You need peace in your conversations. Quit being so fearful. Fear comes from who? The devil. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. That's when God's peace comes upon you that you can have a sound mind. Amen? Your greatest battle is not your coworkers or your spouse or your children. Your greatest battle is what's raging in between your ears. Be peaceful. Be peaceful in your conversations. Be peaceful in your reactions. Why? Because what you sow out is what's going to come back to you. So if you want peace to come back to you, give peace out. Amen? There's a scripture in Jeremiah that says, Pray for the peace and prosperity of the city for which I sent you. For as it goes in the city, so it will go with you. Some of you need to pray for peace and prosperity in your home. Because as it goes in your home, so it's going to go with you. Some of us need to pray for peace and prosperity in our place of work. Because as it goes in our work, so it's going to go with us. Some of us need to pray for peace and prosperity in our city, in our country. Because as it goes, it's going to go with us. And I don't know what you, I'd rather have peace. Amen? Peace is a good thing. Number four, patience. Moving on. Just kidding. How many of you ever struggle with patience? You know, I think the Lord just threw that one in there because none of us are ever going to be perfectly patient. Every once in a while, I struggle with with being patient. In fact, a lot of times I struggle with patience. I hate to wait. How many of you just love long lines and want to wait? Or you go to fast food restaurants and it takes you 15 minutes to get your food at the window? That, I mean, they should rip fast food off the sign. Patience. Ephesians 4 verse 2 says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. See, this taps back into love. Because you want to be a person of love, you'll find yourself being more patient. You're more patient with the people you love. Well, pastors, people I don't love that I'm very impatient with. (laughs) Isn't it funny how patience is something that's constantly working in and out of you? The other day, I was driving my kids somewhere, and I pulled up, and, and, and there was a car in front of me that was at the stoplight to turn onto the highway, and they just sat there, and then they sat there, and you can turn right on red after you come to a complete halt. Many opportunities happened. For this individual from another state, by the way, to get out onto the highway and move out of my way. I wanted so desperately to honk at the person. But I knew it would be ugly horn. Y'all know what I'm talking about, ugly horn. There's a difference between ugly horn and nice horn. Ugly horns, you know what I mean. How many of you have ever, ever been ugly horned? Okay. But then there's nice horn, beep, beep, you know, that's just a little, hey, you're sitting through a green light, time to go, God bless you, I love you, be friendly, hey, go, that's friendly horn. But I wanted to do ugly horn, but I didn't because my children were with me, and I wanted to set an example before my children of what patience was. So what did I do? I yelled at the car in front of me, and they couldn't hear me. What are you waiting on? Don't you know I look like an idiot in her rearview mirror? Now, if you're that person sitting there and you see someone behind you doing that, what do you do? You put it in park. I'm going to prove that they need patience. Patience. It's something we all need. It's something we've all got to work on. It's in us. We don't have to pray for God to give us patience. God gave you patience when you accepted the Holy Spirit. It's in you. You just got to be willing to let it be activated in you. Amen. Moving on. I dwelt there long enough. Kindness. How many know we should be kind people? Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How many of you have ever been forgiven? Yeah, a lot of hands. Then why would we ever withhold it to someone else? Extend kindness to somebody. 
Amen? Number six, goodness. Goodness. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. When you do good, people see it. When you do bad, people see it. Your actions, whether good or bad, are speaking to somebody. They speak. So what are your actions saying? Are your actions pushing you pushing people closer to Jesus, or are your actions pushing people away from Jesus? Well, I'm not a preacher, so it doesn't really matter. No, 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 no. We are all Christians. And people know you're a Christian. Your actions are speaking to people. As I was preparing this sermon, it reminded me of a story about on the front page of the paper. How many of you remember a few years ago we had these bright yellow LC magnets made? Anybody remember those? And so people were getting these LC magnets, and they were slapping them on the back of their cars to say, you know, Life Church, you can come to Life Church. It's going to be a great, you can come to Life Church. We were promoting our church. I opened the front page of the paper. A person had got arrested for robbing a store, and they were at their car. Big yellow LC magnet on the back of that car. So the moral of the story is, if you don't rob a bank, take your magnet off first. We've got our bumper stickers, honk if you love Jesus, and we're flipping people off as we go down the highway. We aren't turning anybody to Jesus. Come on, our actions are speaking louder than our words. We've got to watch our faces. We've got to watch the way we walk into If you walk into a room like this, you know what? You're just downer and negative. Your body language says everything. Throw your shoulders back. Back. Hold your head up high. You're a child of the Most High God. You are filled with His Spirit. His fruit is on the inside of you. And you may have every reason to be down, but just smile anyway and blow your haters away with a smile across your face because they don't understand how you can be happy. The only reason I can be happy when I'm going through hell is because Jesus is in me and the joy of the Lord is my strength. And He said I could do everything through Him who gives me strength. And because of that, I'm going to display play who he is not what I feel faithfulness Ooh, are you a faithful person are you faithful are you faithful on your job when you're supposed to be there you're there are you faithful to your boss or to your co-workers are you faithful to your children are you faithful to church when you say I will serve and then you don't show up are you faithful are you faithful to your spouse Are you faithful to your vows? Stand before people who take vows. And the vow goes something like this. Do you have this woman or do you have this man to be your wedded wife, husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better? And what's the next word? For worse. No one thinks it's ever going to get worse. We could just have better. For better. (laughs) There could be. How How many of you are married and know sometimes the calendar changes? Okay, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor. We don't like the poorer part. For richer and richer. <laughs> Extra bills come in. Oops. In sickness and in health, to love and to cherish and forsaking all, all others, remaining faithful to her, him, so long as you both shall live. That means if a friendship is getting in the way of your marriage, you're to forsake that friendship. Your marriage should be first. That means if a coworker is flirting with you and they're looking good and smelling good and your spouse has been in their pajamas for two days and have been sick and have bad breath, push the coworker away because you're going to be faithful to your vow. Faithfulness is huge. You've got to be, if you are not faithful in small things, you won't be faithful in big things. And God will not bring you big things until you're faithful in the small things. Number eight, gentleness. Are you gentle? 1 Peter 3, 4 says, A gentle and quiet spirit is so precious to God. God does not fill His believers with the Holy Spirit for us to be spiritual bullies. We do not need to go around and tear people down. Well, they're just sinners. Aren't we all? Well, they're just struggling. 
haven't you? We need to be gentle with people. Be gentle with people. And number nine could be the most important of them all. Self-control. Who's got the control? You do. God does not just pick up your hands and say, worship me. You have control. I'm going to worship him today. God does not just throw a Bible open in front of you for you to read. You have to pick it up and say, I will read it. God does not just throw you to your knees and say, pray to me. You have to choose to pray. It's self-control that determines the activation of all the rest of the fruit. You get to choose whether or not you're going to love somebody. You get to choose whether or not you're going to be joy-filled. You get to choose whether or not you're going to be peaceful, if you're going to be faithful, gentle, kind. You get to choose whether or not you're going to do that. It's self-control. Jude chapter 1, verse 24 says, God is strong and can help you not to fall. With the Holy Spirit in us, the Spirit's full fruit dwell on the inside of us. Their activity in our everyday life is determined upon us. Are we going to allow them to be active or not? Are we going to allow them to be a part of our life? Yesterday I was driving around town and I was going looking for some different things I want to plant in my garden. And I was looking at all these stores and all these stores were closed. And I just thought, ah. And I was just having one of those days. Have you ever just had one of those days where you just kind of feel blah? And you can't put your finger on anything as to why you feel blah, but you just feel blah. And so you're just there. And I was just kind of like a little bit mad and a little bit sad and a little bit frustrated and irritable and all those things. I know none of you, have not, y'all are perfect. It was first service, they manned me down because they needed it, not you. But I mean, I was just, I was just there. And it was like the Holy Spirit said to me, Taryn, what are you preaching on tomorrow? So the fruits of the Spirit he said, have you activated them in your life today? No. So there I was driving down electric. And I said, Holy Spirit, I know you're in me. I need your fruit to be released in my life right now. Would you give me peace? Would you give me your, your, your love? Did you release these fruit that will take over my mind? And do you know, my attitude changed. Isn't that ironic? When we put God at his word and we try him, it works. So have you. Have you put him in charge? Have you allowed him to do what he can do inside of you? You see, I can love people, but if I'm not patient, my love doesn't mean anything. All of us are going to always have to work some fruit in our life. But here's the deal. You don't have to beg God to give you the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are in you. You just have to choose to allow them to become active in your life. You just have to choose to allow them to be initiated in the way you talk and the way you act and the way you react to people. Are you choosing these things? If we are recognized by our fruit, what does our fruit say about our life to others? Do you need to get rid of some old stinky fruit? Because the sinful nature produces fruit too. It's rotten and it stinks. And it makes people miserable. And people around you are miserable. But if you will just push those rotten fruit out, and you'll say, okay, as a spirit-filled believer, I want the fruits of the Spirit to come out into my life. That's when the good fruit that is not rotten, that is not spoiled, that people don't want to be around, will become activated. Amen? It's in you, but have you activated it? If you're recognized by your fruit, what are the fruit of your life saying about your life? Would you bow your heads with me? Whether you're watching on Facebook or you're here in this auditorium right now, if you do not have Jesus in your life, you are not spirit-filled. And therefore, you do not have the fruits of the Spirit inside of you. But today, you can receive Him as your Lord and Savior You can join two people who prayed it in our first service. 
and you can become spirit-filled right now, right where you sit, and those fruit can be there to help you and to help you grow. If that's you this morning, you would say, yes, pastor, I need Jesus in my life, and I know it. I know I am not saved. If that's you, would you just slip a hand up and just put it back down so I know who I'm praying for? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Is there anyone else that would say, yes, I know I need Jesus in my life. I know I am not saved. Thank you, sir. God bless you. There's been two hands in this service. I celebrate that. Thank you, Lord. That's such a wonderful thing. Secondly, if you're here today and you would say, Taryn, I know I'm a Christian, and I know the Spirit's in me, but I sure have been paying more attention to some sinful nature fruit instead of living for the fruits of the Spirit. Maybe one of those nine is lacking, and you need it activated in your life. Maybe you're not very patient or kind or gentle. Maybe you're not being faithful. Maybe you're not filled with joy or peace. Maybe you've not initiated self-control in your life. But today, you want to say, Holy Spirit, help me to tap into these fruit and let them be released in my life. If that's you, can I see your hand this morning? Good, 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 good. God bless you. Lots of hands. That's good, that's good. Would you stand with me, church? We're going to go into a time of worship, and I'm going to invite you that lifted your hands or you did not to meet me right here at this altar, and we're going to pray together. We're going to pray for each other, and we're going to say a sinner's prayer together because there were hands that went up for salvation, and that's so wonderful. Amen? Amen. So come on. If you lifted your hands, I want you to come. If you didn't, I want you to come. But you need God. You need His Spirit. You need Him to touch you. You need Him to release these fruit inside of you. This is what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer as we worship together for it to be initiated in us. Church, I'd like somebody to stand behind each and every person. If you see someone down here you know or you don't know, but you feel compelled to come, come. And let's pray together. Let's agree together. Can we do that? Let's say this sinner's prayer together out loud for the hands that went up for salvation. Everybody, would you pray with me? Say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you, that you are the Son of God, that you died and rose again. So I repent of all my sins, of all my past, separated from you. And I choose right now to surrender my life to you. Take up residence inside of me. Holy Spirit, fill me and bring your fruit in me and help me from this day forward to activate those fruit in my life, to walk away from the things I need to walk away from and run towards the things that I need. I receive you and I believe in you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, let's continue to pray as we worship together. His fruit. You're recognized by His fruit. You're recognized by His fruit.
Amen. Well, aren't you glad you were here today? Amen. What a great day. What a great message. Take it to heart. Allow the fruits of the Spirit to be in your life. And I know, I can promise you, you'll be a lot better person. God bless you. Shake hands. Be friendly. You're dismissed. Thank you.